Welcome back to day four of the Pressure Purge Challenge. And we're gonna start tonight's session off by basically doing a quick recap of day one, two, and three. That way we all can make sure we're on the same page and understand you know, the details of the Pressure Purge Challenge. So I welcome you guys to day four and let's dive right into it. You know, No need to even keep us waiting. So uh, day one, we broke down the ins and outs and the rules of the Pressure Purge Challenge. And we also started to go with, we also started to dive into the foods that we're going to be removing throughout this process. And then day one, we broke down sodium, understanding salt, sodium, and, and the pathways that it can contribute to your blood pressure issues. Day two, we broke down oils, understanding all the different types of oils and how they can potentially contribute to endothelial dysfunction, leading to you know further comp further cardiovascular complications. Day three, we dove into sugars, understanding the ins and outs of you know, those processed and refined sugars and how they can contribute to these blood pressure issues. And today, we're going to round everything off by understanding, um, understanding caffeine, coffee, the excessive consumption of animal-based products, and a few other items. So if you have your um, ebook, your seven day pressure purge challenge ebook and a second device, feel free to pull it out so you can follow along. We're on chapter six and this will be the last day of the challenge as far as um, the live classes. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to start at chapter six. I'm going to read through the ebook and that way we can start diving into these different sessions a lot more deeper, a lot, a lot more deeper. So we can just continue to grasp the understanding of why it's so important to remove these foods from the diet on the journey to correcting these blood pressure issues. <clears throat> so uh, we're, on we're on chapter six, understanding caffeine and alcohol. Those are two very, very important places, and we're gonna begin there. So caffeine acts as a stimulant on the central nervous system, similar to substances like cocaine and amphetamines. It has the ability to increase heart rate, alter blood vessel size, and affect various physiological functions such as blood pressure, coronary circulation, and urination. Just three cups of coffee, for instance, contains enough caffeine to raise the body basal metabolic rate by up to 25%, significantly increasing activity levels. Now, we have to understand where coffee or caffeine falls in the classification of uh, especially how it uh, relates to your health and your blood pressure. So coffee itself, or caffeine, rather, I would like to address the caffeine because uh, caffeine is the substance that's actually contributing to the problem. Uh, caffeine is what's called a vasoconstrictor, and I spoke about this several times. Uh, caffeine is a vasoconstrictor, and what this means is that every time caffeine is present inside of your, your, your body, it causes your blood vessels to constrict. Now, the thing about coffee is this. It doesn't necessarily cause high blood pressure. It's not the root cause of the problem, but it can contribute to elevated blood pressure levels. And if you're on this journey of getting to the root cause and understanding why your pressure is high, it's important that you pull this item out of your diet and allow for you to continue to move forward with a better understanding. Because if you're continuously consuming coffee, this is going to uh, cause your blood pressure to stay elevated and you're not going to necessarily have a clear view of what's causing the problem. So removing coffee from the diet will eliminate this vasoconstriction that's occurring on a cellular level and allow for the blood pressure to decrease. So understanding the role that these items play is going to be very important. Consuming caffeine can elevate blood pressure due to its effect on the body. It is crucial to eliminate coffee and other caffeinated beverages from the diet when addressing the underlying cause of, of high blood pressure. Now, this also goes for your energy drinks, your sodas, and every other beverage that has caffeine in it. There's, there's even some teas out there that have very high levels of caffeine. And again, that caffeine causes this vasoconstriction that can contribute to the problem. So understanding that these items need to be analyzed and removed if they contain excessive amounts of caffeine in order for you to pinpoint that issue that may be going on there. So coffee, caffeinated beverages, energy drinks, even there's even supplements and and other items that contain excessive amount of caffeine. So we have to understand that any items that contain that contain caffeine should be pulled from the diet. Next up is going to be alcohol. 
Um, alcohol is an addictive substance with one in eight individuals who consume it developing a lifelong addiction. Its addiction, this, its addictive nature surpasses that of many other drugs. Despite this, alcohol is treated differently by the government, being considered a non-drug and subjected to licensing, taxation, and extensive marketing campaigns promoting its consumption. We all know that alcohol can damage the liver, contribute to the formation of ulcers, enlarge the heart, and lead to destruct, destruction of brain cells. Its detrimental effects extend to both the body and the mind, and it's crucial to recognize alcohol as a lethal substance and avoid viewing it as a social lubricant or a harmless relaxant. Alcohol is a drug and has no place in a healthy lifestyle. Now, before we dive too deep into the alcohol, I want to make sure I give you guys um, a few tactics and strategies as well to help you remove the coffee or caffeine from your diet and as well as answer some questions regarding like other coffees like and I get a lot of questions about mushroom coffee and a few other ones so if you have any questions about those feel free to drop them in the chat but I'll try to make sure I give you guys some options to use now when it comes down to coffee uh, caffeinated coffee is the problem Decaf is a better option, although it does have lower levels of caffeine. But if you're if you're someone that's making the adjustment and you're you're you you consume coffee all the time, just quitting coffee is probably going to cause you more issues than you know than you really want to deal with through this process. So understanding the steps that you can take to gradually reduce your 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 caffeine consumption is going to be very important. So the first thing that you can do is start by cutting the amount of coffee in half that you're consuming. So let's say you're having three cups of coffee per day. Just start cutting it down and reducing the amount that you're consuming. That's going to be a step in the right direction. And one of the best ways you can reduce the amount of caffeine that's in there is by cutting the coffee with half decaf and half caffeinated. That way you still have the volume of coffee that you typically consume, but less caffeine in it. And although this isn't a huge change, it's a nice big step in the right direction when it comes down to the reduction. And that's where you wanna gradually get better and do this with intentions. Because again, one thing about uh, these types of strategies you don't want to be uncomfortable as you pursue this goal because this discomfort that you may be experiencing, it can cause you to, to be stressed. And this, this stress can contribute to other unhealthy habits and cause you to ultimately just throw in the towel during this process. So the last thing you want to do is do something that stresses you out and it causes you to just uh, some just it causes you to deal with certain levels of uncomfort of, of discomfort. And instead of going through this discomforting process, understand the steps or the journey that you can take that's going to help you ease through it. So reducing your, caf your, your caffeine levels by cutting your regular coffee with the decaffeinated version is one step that you can use and then just start to slowly dial back. That's going to help you slowly wean down on the amount of caffeine that you're consuming and it's going to lessen the detoxification effects because I can guarantee you when you cut off coffee just out the blue your body will go through this detoxification stage and it can a lot of different symptoms can come up with that with irritability being one of the biggest ones you just kind of get the jitters and feel like something is off and there's no way you can work or just get through your day with that type of feeling so understanding these steps is going to be key uh, number two you can simply just switch to uh, another type of beverage, let's say a green tea. Uh, some green teas do have um, caffeine in them, although it's a much lower levels than a few of them, but there are some decaffeinated green teas out there, some matcha style teas that are, you know, that are still that still has a degree of stimulation that's going to have less caffeine in it and allow for you to continue to just move forward. Because a lot of individuals that have that coffee addiction or just love coffee so much, they're just used to having something in their hand. I, ironically, like uh, several individuals that I've coached through the past, they're just used to driving with the cup in their hand or in their office with the cup in their hand. And then when they don't have a cup, they just don't know what to do with their hands a little bit. But, you know, just understanding that having a, substitu a substitute or a green tea 
for instance, can allow you to still have that stimulation that you're looking for to continue to move through. But now, instead of having that excessive amount of caffeine, you have something that's mild, a, a lot less stimulating that's going to help move you in the right direction. Not to mention that the phytonutrients and the other plant compounds that it contains are beneficial for your cardiovascular system as well. And it's going to help you on the journey. So this is just substituting uh, something that uh, has a negative impact for something that's more health promoting and it's going to allow for you to just understand. And again, during this process, you want to make sure you document how you feel because this is one of the biggest things because a lot of times individuals that are so wired up on coffee throughout the day, week after week, month after month, all the time, they don't, they, they're, they're at this, they have this heightened level of stimulation that's going on throughout their body and they may not understand how things feel once they may not understand like how the well, let me rephrase this when you're overstimulated and you start making lifestyle changes and making the adjustments and you remove these types of stimulation your body starts to tone things down and you notice the difference in your energy levels your sleeping habits your communication or your digestive system a lot of different areas so documenting your journey through this process will allow for you to gain a grasp of the big picture. And remember, when you're on this journey of correcting your blood pressure issues, you're dealing with a, a big puzzle of things that you need to understand. And as you document your journey, this allows for you to put piece by piece together. And over the course of, the, of these challenges or these time that we're doing these things, these pieces will come together and paint a picture for you to understand exactly what's causing your problem and allow for you to gradually get better and correct these types of issues. So understanding that coffee is one of those items, although it does have other stimulating benefits because the, the information behind coffee is so vast. It's a lot of information. I have a book up here that I've been reading for the last couple of years and the information and the research behind coffee is so vast. And this is one thing that gave me an understanding that coffee should be eliminated. And it goes like this. There are, there's a ton of information that says coffee is great. There's a ton of information that says coffee is bad. <coughs> there's a ton of information that says both of these, it goes in opposition. And what happens is when you look into the literature and try to understand, because you can easily say, oh, coffee, helps improve your heart health and it does all these other great things for the cardiovascular system which is true it does have a lot of these benefits but we when you look at the science and the data and and comprehend it for what it is as a whole you you tend to understand the long-term effects and the underlying effects of what this coffee is doing when it comes down to the cardiovascular system and your health specifically for individuals that are dealing with blood pressure issues because all these studies showcase the immediate benefits of sipping coffee, the energy levels that you get, which is a false sense of energy because it's a stimulant. It's a stimulation that you're getting. Your heart starts to pump faster. When the heart starts to pump faster, it starts to send more nutrients and more blood to the different levels, to the different organs and um, cells of the body. So now they start to function at a higher rate. So you get this false stimulation and you get this increase in energy and you start feeling good. But what happens is you start to come down as well. And when you start coming down, you, oh, I need another cup. And then now you're just overstimulating yourself and create another cycle. But the main thing about this is, is this. If you follow the, the studies and you follow the money, you understand this part. Coffee is the number two traded commodity in the world behind oil. Oil is first, coffee is next. So when you start saying things about coffee that are bad and people should stay away from it if you're dealing with blood pressure issues and all these other things, now it creates the financial war because many individuals that sell coffee, that profit off of coffee, they have a financial tie to it. Starbucks fund studies. Um, there are many different other Folgers and coffee organizations that fund studies to see what is coffee good for. So understanding that if you're finding a study to find out what it's good for, of course you're gonna find something. But understanding that when you look into the coffee to see like how it works and what, how, what impacts it has on a certain group of individuals, this tells another story. And when it comes down to dealing with blood pressure issues and trying to correct the root cause or trying to get to the root cause of the problem, coffee has no value for you. 
And if your goal is to get off of prescription pills, do away with the coffee for an, an indefinite period of time. You ain't got to do it forever, but do away with it and understand if this is part of the problem. And the better you're able to see if it's part of the problem, now you can make an educated guess. And if your body starts telling you that, hey, man, I like it without coffee and I feel so much better and, you know, your energy levels come back, I'm sleeping better. This is your body language telling you that, hey, we probably could do without this, this overstimulation. And this is what's going to allow these doors to continue to open up for you to progress and move in the right direction. So coffee is definitely something that should be pulled from the diet. And the better you understand it and go through the process of doing so, the, the better your results are going to be. Because a lot of individuals, again, they're overstimulated throughout the day. As soon as you consume coffee, the blood pressure rises. And if you're consuming multiple cups of coffee throughout the day, the blood pressure stays elevated as long as that caffeine is in the system. And then once it leaves the system, then it starts to come down. And then what happens is most individuals go to sleep, wake back up, and they get, uh, get their double shot of coffee or whatever they're having, and the blood pressure comes right up. So simply removing it, co removing coffee can allow for your blood pressure to come back down to a, a normal level, even though it may still be elevated, it'll come back down to a normal level, and it'll still give you some insights on what's happening. And when you compound this strategy of removing coffee from your diet, on top of everything else that we're seeing, this is gonna impact change. And when these changes that you're doing or acting on, this is gonna reflect somewhere. And this reflects in your overall health, your blood pressure, your weight, your, your, your sleeping habits, all these different things. And this is where the big picture starts to come together at. So now we're gonna move into caffeine. Uh, we're gonna move into alcohol. That way we can understand the role that alcohol plays. And um, I lost my page, so y'all forgive me. I'm just scrolling back to my page. Uh, we're going to go with alcohol right now. So now when it comes down to alcohol, we've all heard the, the saying that uh, a glass of red wine is good for the heart and has many uh, great health benefits for the cardiovascular system. And this is true. There's a lot of studies that show this. But the biggest problem that I've seen through uh, my practice with helping individuals understand more about their blood pressure and their cardiovascular system, most people don't understand this, the, the studies. They don't understand the information. They just got this piece of information in the wind and they ran with it. They just say, oh, I, this alcohol is good for, this, this red wine is good for my, my cardiovascular system. I'm gonna have a glass every night to help me go to sleep and to help in different other areas. Most people took that information and they went far left with it. So understanding the root of the science will allow for you to gain a grasp of how this works. Now, the thing inside of alcohol that helps it, um, that helps give it the benefits is resveratrol. And I hope I said that right. For some reason, I always butcher that role. Resveratrol. Resveratrol is basically, it comes through the skin of the grapes that are being pressed to create the create the red wine and it does has a lot of antioxidants and other nutrients that help with the cardiovascular system and contribute to improved blood pressure blood flow and things like that this is the resveratrol now when you create the red wine and the alcohol it now becomes a stimulant that that can contribute to uh, that can have detrimental effects on the cardiovascular system. And we have to understand how this happens. So when you create wine and you go through the process, it becomes a lot different from actually eating grapes or, or yeah, eating grapes off the vine. It's totally two totally different things. Same nutrients, but totally different process. So understanding that when they did these studies, they broke down how much of this resveratrol or how much wine that you can consume to get these health benefits. And the amount was startling. Now they did this study and the amount of, of red wine that you can consume to get the benefits of the resveratrol for your cardiovascular system is only four ounces. That's like a little small ramekin, a little small cup, you know, like one of those little, like, like a double shot, basically. A double shot of wine is how much you can consume to get those health benefits without causing damage. So 
the wine company saw the information. They were like, oh, this is great. You can consume wine and have these health benefits. And they took it and went left. And when they went left with it, the information came back and people were saying, oh, red wine is good for your health. But we have to see the full spectrum. Four ounces of red wine has health benefits to a certain degree. Anything over four ounces is considered uh, overindulging or heavy drinking. And this is the, the medical literature. Anything, anytime you, you consume over four ounces of alcohol, this is considered over drinking and it has detrimental effects on your overall health directly with starting with your blood pressure and moving on throughout other areas of your body. As soon as you consume over four ounces of red wine, beer, uh, any other alcohols, it goes right into your cardiovascular system. It damages those endothelial cells. The blood vessels start to constrict. And the more you go with drinking and, and indulging, it continues to happen more and more. One of the, the tall tale signs of a stressed out cardiovascular system or, and damage to the endothelial, system, endothelial cells is this. When people tend to over drink, the first thing, one of the main things we notice about them is, you know, outside of their swaying or their, you know, their, 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 their tone, their eyes begin to turn red. And when that sign of your eyes being red while drinking is a sign that your cardiovascular system or your blood vessels are constricting. And now the blood flow and the pressure is so high that it's starting to showcase itself through your eyes. So understanding that that's the end spectrum uh, when it comes down to over drinking. But as soon as you consume more than four ounces of this red wine, now this vasoconstriction starts to happen and now instead of having those heart healthy wine benefits you start to get the destructive parts of it so anything over four ounces starts to uh, cause cardiovascular damage now this does not mean that you cannot have wine ever again i'm not going to say that but this means during this period of time you're gonna have to you're gonna have to cut back and eliminate it in order to understand what's happening. Because if you're trying to make sure that your blood pressure is, is in line and you're trying to improve your health, you cannot continuously consume something that can cause damage. Even if you're trying to just stay under four ounces, it's easier just to say, you know what, let me do away with this for a little while. Let me let me just put this to the side so I can figure out this problem. And again, once you gain control, you gain an understanding, you build these health promoting habits, you build your body back up and you correct these blood pressure issues. Now you can decide that, oh, I'm going to have a glass of wine with my friends or have this. You can make a decision on this type of um, habit because you're not suffering from the cardiovascular issues. You have more control. You have more freedom. But until you correct the problem, you got to be a lot more tighter. You have to dial back and allow for these adjustments to happen. So removing the uh, alcohol, all types from the diet is going to be a big part of it. Don't give yourself any window to try to, you know, dial back. Just pull it out, you know. And if you can't pull it out because, you know, you need this type of stimulation, this is something else that you're going to have to work on. And, um, you know, this is part of the process of just getting better. So here we go. Alcohol can damage the liver. Alcohol, we read that one already. Boom. Excessive alcohol consumption can raise blood pressure to unhealthy levels. Regular episodes of binge drinking can lead to long-term increases in blood pressure. Reducing alcohol intake can lower systolic blood pressure by approximately 5.5 milliliters of mercury and diastolic by, by about 4 millimeters. Uh, these are some of the stats that are in there as well about how, how blood pressure can come down by simply removing certain things from the diet. I'm not going to get too deep into the stats because those of you that have the ebook, you can just go into the stats and uh, read it a little bit closer. But what happens is this, and I, this is where you know compounding strategies becomes really important because let's say you do remove the alcohol from your diet, even if it's just one glass a night. You remove the alcohol from your diet you're talking a five point, four point swing in your blood pressure once you start to remove it and, and once you eliminate it from the diet. You remove the oils from your diet. You're gonna see where you know, you're eliminating the excess amount of calories that comes from the oil. Now you know, you're gonna see the change in your weight. Now you're gonna see where your triglycerides start to come down and your cholesterol comes down because oil has a direct impact on these levels as well. Because again, oil is a pure form of fat. And your 
triglyceride levels is roughly a, a estimate of how much fat is floating around in the bloodstream. So when you reduce the oil, re you reduce these numbers as well. And this is going to be a domino effect that starts to come together. And when you eliminate the salt and then the sugars and all these things start to come out, these are all pathways that can potentially contribute to blood pressure issues that's closed down. You close these pathways down and continue to implement the health promoting foods. Now you build your body up. You give your body the potassium, the magnesium, the calcium, the, the, the right amounts of sodium, the zinc, the antioxidants, all those enzymes that it needs to build healthy cells and become nice and strong and resilient to manage the blood pressure without the need of pharmaceutical medications. And when you build that body back up, build those nutritional storages back up, implement those health promoting habits, your health gets better and the blood pressure comes down. So this is the pattern of things that happens. So understanding that these are all different pathways and sometimes everyone doesn't have the same issue. So you must be willing to identify what your problem is and say, okay, I don't drink, but I do eat a lot of sugar. So let me uh, pull this sugar out of here. Or I do, I do drink and I do have a lot of sugar. Let me pull these out. So this is the process of understanding where you're at, where you need to go and documenting the journey to actually get there. Here we go. Now we're on chapter seven, understanding animal based products. And this is a very important chapter for every individual that's here. So the, we must understand that the overconsumption of animal based products is a big problem, especially for individuals dealing with blood pressure issues. And we're going to get into some of the scientific data about, you know, animal-based products. We're going to talk about a whole food plant-based diet. We're going to talk about all these other nutritional strategies as well because I'm a firm believer that, you know, it's not really, it, it, your nutrition plays a big role in this process, but one, one strategy doesn't necessarily fit everyone. So we'll talk about this a little bit deeper. That way you can understand, you know, a bulletproof strategy that will allow you to continue to move forward through this journey. So in this chapter, we'll explore the significance of eliminating or reducing the consumption of animal-based products in the context of managing blood pressure. We will delve into the effects of saturated fats and cholesterol on blood pressure and cholesterol levels, as well as their roles in promoting the development of, of arterial plaque. Additionally, we will examine how individuals following a plant-based diet tend to have lower blood pressure compared to meat eaters. Lastly, we will, we will unravel the connection between the consumption of red meat and processed meats with higher blood pressure. So we're gonna start with saturated fats. Saturated fats predominantly found in animal-based products have been linked to increased blood pressure and elevated cholesterol levels. These saturated fats can disrupt the normal functioning of blood vessels, leading to constriction and higher resistance within the arteries. As a result, blood pressure tends to rise. Furthermore, saturated fats can raise the LDL cholesterol, commonly known as the bad cholesterol, which can contribute to arterial plaque formation. So understanding that saturated fats, which is typically found in a lot of the, the red meats and the fatty cuts of meats, those are something that we have to remove from our diet. Those fatty cuts of meats, they have to be pulled out because if you're still consuming those saturated fats, you're going to be on the hamster wheel going back and forth wondering why I'm not gaining the ground that I need to, although I'm doing all these other things you're not getting where you want to be because of a lot of the saturated fats, particularly in the, in the consumption of red meats. So understanding saturated fats can be a trigger. And this isn't just about red meats as well, because a lot of, a lot of other foods have saturated fats. And one of them that I typically use a lot is um, in a few of my recipes is the, um, the coconut milk. Coconut milk is very high in saturated fats, although it's a healthier item that we presume to be a healthier item, it has a lot of saturated fats. So understanding the adjustments, which what I do is instead of using uh, the, the whole form of coconut milk, I use a lighter form that drastically reduces the amounts of saturated fats that way you can make the necessary adjustments for any recipes that you're doing. But understanding that saturated fats plays a direct role and the overconsumption of animal-based products, red meats, is one key area that has a lot of saturated fats that contribute to the blood pressure issues. Next up, cholesterol. <clears throat> 
High levels of cholesterol, particularly the LDL cholesterol, can have detrimental effects on blood pressure regulation. Excessive cholesterol can accumulate in the arterial walls, leading to the formation of plaque. This process, known as atherosclerosis, narrows the arteries and restricts blood flow as blood pressure rises to compensate for the decreased vessel diameter, and then hypertension can ensue. Now, this goes back to understanding your endothelium system. And remember, in the last couple of days, we, was, we, went, we talked about how the endothelium system is the protector of the cardiovascular system. And when you're dealing with blood pressure issues, this endothelium system is starting to dysfunction. Now, again, the endothelium system has three, um, three jobs, three main jobs. Yeah, I'm going to do jobs, but three main jobs. Produce nitric oxide so the blood vessels can dilate. Stay nice and tight so the walls of the blood vessels can be nice and smooth so the blood can flow through smoothly. And then stay nice and tight so nothing can penetrate the cell walls. Now, well, penetrate the cell walls and enter into the body. And when you're dealing with endothelial dysfunction, this shows up in the form of uh, high cholesterol and uh, atherosclerosis and other type of plaques and blockages in the blood vessels. Now, what's happened is the endothelial cells start to move out of place and start to shift and rub up against each other. And now there's gaps in your armor. And now um, when you're consuming these fatty foods and these oils and these other items, now the plaque is floating through the arteries and they see that little gap and they kind of shove up and get stuck inside of there. And now, before you know it, it starts to build up and disrupts the flow. So understanding that your cholesterol issues is part of this problem. It's, it's contributing to the problem and it's also, um, it's, the problem's being increased by this whole issue that's happening. So understanding the tactics of removing excessive animal-based products from the diet will allow for you to reduce your cholesterol levels. So understand that cholesterol is a vital part of your body. So let's start there. Your body needs cholesterol. It produces its own cholesterol, and it, it needs cholesterol. Cholesterol is found in every cell of the body. It's, it lines your intestines. Cholesterol is everywhere. It has many different functions, and a lot of times cholesterol gets demonized because, you know, we think of high cholesterol, then we think about heart attacks and strokes, but it's not necessarily the case. Cholesterol is essential for your overall health. Without cholesterol, you won't have certain hormones that your body needs to function. So understanding cholesterol is the key part, but what happens is your body makes its own, but the overconsumption of animal-based products it loads us up with cholesterol, and now this becomes a problem. Cholesterol is only found in animal-based products and processed foods. Like, you don't get cholesterol from plant foods or whole grains or nuts and seeds. You don't get cholesterol from that. You get cholesterol from only animal-based products and processed foods. So if cholesterol is your issue, understanding your consumption of animal-based products is going to be the first place to start and this is where you start to uh, reduce your consumption and even eliminate your consumption. You will see those numbers start to come down. But more importantly, we have to understand the difference between the LDL cholesterol and the HDL cholesterol. The LDL cholesterol is considered to be the bad cholesterol and the HDL is going to be your good cholesterol. So when you consume a high amount of animal-based products, the LDL cholesterol levels are tend to be elevated for most people. The LDL, the cholesterol, the LDL, the triglycerides, they tend to be elevated. And the HDL is a lot lower because when it comes down to HDL, you get these predominantly from plant foods. And when you consume more plant foods, more whole foods, this LDL cholesterol has a job to do. And the job of this, um, I'm sorry, this HDL cholesterol has a job to do. And the job of the HDL cholesterol that you get from these whole foods is to go through the artery and or the blood vessels and sweep out the H the sweep out the LDL cholesterol. Clean the arteries, pick up the LDL cholesterol that may be blocking the way, taking it back to the liver so the liver can reprocess it and break it down and use it for something else. So when you have this excessive amount of LDL cholesterol all throughout the, the, the cardiovascular system, throughout the arteries and, and different blockages all over the place, and the HDL is lower, these blockages continue to build up. So the strategy to correct this is to reduce or eliminate your consumption of animal-based products as well as 
increase your consumption of whole foods, more plant-based products. That way you can get a balance of HDL cholesterol, the good cholesterol into your system so they can come through, start to sweep out the arteries and clean things up. Now, this isn't the only way to, um, to, collect, to correct cholesterol issues because as well, when it comes down to cholesterol, exercising is, is one. Uh, managing your stress is another. Um, improving your sleeping habits. Those are all different things, but by far one of the best things you can do is the best, one of the best things you can do to correct your cholesterol issues is to stop consuming the excessive amount. Your body can naturally make its own, but the overconsumption of animal-based products is the biggest cause of elevated cholesterol levels. So if you eliminate the overconsumption and reduce and even eliminate it for an indefinite period of time, this will allow for you to gain ground and most importantly, understanding. Because the better you understand what's happening, now you can make conscious decisions moving forward. And that's what it's all about, learning. Learning what to do and learning the adjustments to make. And as you start to see the changes in your body, the changes in your numbers when you go to the doctor, now you're more educated about the things you were doing and now you have a path to follow. And as you continue to live in a health promoting way, your health is only going to get better. It doesn't just, oh, well, it's over. Like you, you, the healthiest version of you. No, you get better. Your body continues to get better as you continue to implement uh, these tactics and strategies. So next up, the role of saturated fats and cholesterol and arterial plaque development. Consuming saturated fats and cholesterol contribute to the development of arterial plaque, which is a significant factor in high blood pressure. The accumulation of plaque narrows and stiffens the arteries, impeding blood flow, increasing blood pressure levels. This further underscores the importance of reducing animal-based product consumption to mitigate plaque formation and maintain optimum blood pressure balance. Now, plant-based diets and lower blood pressure. Research indicates that individuals adhering to a plant-based diet tends to have lower blood pressure compared to those who consume meat. Plant-based diets are typically rich in fiber, antioxidants, and phytonutrients, which have beneficial effects on blood pressure regulation. Additionally, plant-based diets are naturally low in saturated fats and cholesterol, contributing to improved cardiovascular health and reduced blood pressure. Now, we've all heard about the DASH diet. And, you know, Mrs. DASH is bigger than just the seasoning blend that they have um, that they have out there. You have the, they have, the DASH diet was a whole program that was created specifically for individuals dealing with blood pressure issues. And the DASH diet is a plant-based diet. They named it different things. It's changed several times, but at its core, the DASH diet is a plant-based diet. And one thing that we have to understand is the word plant-based because a lot of times when we hear plant-based we think vegan, we think uh, whole food plant-based, we, think we, we tend to go to, in different directions. So I'm gonna give you the raw definition of a, uh, of a plant-based diet. That way you can understand how to build on your tactic or your strategy that you're using. When it comes down to a plant-based diet, a plant-based diet essentially means a diet that is predominantly based around plant foods. Now, this doesn't mean that it's totally all, it's all plant foods. That's more so of a whole food plant-based diet. But a plant-based diet is a diet that's based around whole foods. And what that means is if you take a circular plate, on one, one portion is gonna be whole grains. The next portion is gonna be uh, fruits and vegetables. It's gonna be um, leafy greens and vegetables. Another portion is gonna be um, uh, let's say maybe some some fresh fruits and the last little small corner is going to be a, a portion of whatever animal based product that a person may be consumed so the predominant the predominant focus on that plate is whole foods because those whole those whole foods provide you with the fiber the water the vitamins the minerals the enzymes and all those other things that your body needs in order to function at its optimum level and that small source of protein that a person has there it does have its benefits as well but a whole food plant-based diet a plant-based diet focuses on um, a variety of all plant-based foods so that's where the foundation of the plant-based diet starts at now when you move into let's say the vegan diet the vegan diet doesn't consume any animal, but doesn't allow any animal-based products. So no milk, no cheese, no dairy, no, uh, no fish, no fowl, 
no, um, no red meat, nothing, no animal-based products whatsoever. And that's where a vegan diet starts at. But the thing about a vegan diet that kind of like, you know, that's edgy to me personally is because a lot of things are accidentally vegan. And then most people that are vegan tend to enjoy those accidentally vegan things. And what those items are is like Coca-Cola, uh, Oreos, um, ramen, you know, ramen noodles. Uh, it's a lot of accidentally, like potato chips. All those are like, can be accidentally vegan because no animal products are used to create them. But the thing about it is that although they're vegan, they're not necessarily beneficial for your health. They can be highly processed. They can contain other additives and ingredients that can compromise your health as a whole. So understanding just because it says vegan doesn't necessarily mean that it's health promoting. So it's the thin line in between there. And a lot of times when we try to make dietary adjustments for health reasons, we tend to reach into this vegan category. Then we see a lot of the plant substitutes that and, uh, the Beyond Meats and the other far out there things, all those things contain salt, oils, sugars, so saturated what, salt, oils, sugars, and other components that can impact your health. So if you're making dietary adjustments, be very mindful of those key things because that plays a role in how it, it plays a role in management of your blood pressure. So we got the plant-based diet, went the vegan diet, and now we're going to talk about the whole food plant-based diet. Now, again, they all kind of sound the same again. So the whole food plant-based diet, this is based around whole foods as closest as they look in nature. And what that means is a pumpkin is a pumpkin, an apple is an apple, uh, kale is kale, uh, wild rice is wild rice. A sweet potato is a sweet potato. A whole item that's packaged up how nature provided it to you. And when you consume a whole food plant-based diet, you consume those foods in their whole form. And a whole food plant-based diet it doesn't contain any animal-based products because, again, you're not eating the whole item. You're not eating the whole thing. So it requires that you consume the whole item as it is to get the maximum amount of benefits from it. So understanding that when you're making nutritional adjustments, you know, the primary focus should be plant-based. And when it's plant-based, this builds your foundation to allow you to consume more whole foods. That way, as you're making the nutritional adjustments, you're giving your body what it needs and you're reducing the burden from any outside sources, particularly those excessive consumption of animal-based products those processed foods and those things like that. So understanding where you're at on the spectrum and how to move forward is going to be very important. Now, it's three things that you have to understand no matter what diet you try to choose. It doesn't matter if you do a keto diet, no matter if you do a, a paleo diet or one of the many thousands of diets that are out there. It's three things that you should understand. And these three things are this. And they're more so rules. And these rules are based off of what you call the blue zones, the areas throughout the uh, throughout the world where people tend to be a hundred plus years old. They have the most uh, cent centennials on record for um, for those particular areas. And what these three rules are: this number one, no processed food. Every diet can attest to this fact. You look at any diet: the keto diet, the vegan diet, uh, or the keto diet, the whole food plant based diet. For, for, for the most part, the vegan diet as well. The majority of diets all say no processed foods. Stay away from the processed foods, the chips, the candy, the soda, the, um, the, all the things in the package or the can that are highly processed and refined. If you stay away from those, you can eliminate a great deal of problems. So all these diets say no processed foods. Number two, reducing your consumption of animal-based products is going to be key. And this is where you look at in the blue zones where they don't have the high blood pressure. They don't have the heart attacks. They don't have the cancers. They don't have all those things that fall in between. They drastically reduce their consumption of animal-based products. You're talking one to two servings per week of animal-based products, and that's it. They're not doing anything over that. And you see the individuals in these zones, 100, 120 years old, and the best part about it, they're not just uh, uh, just there. They're actually existing. They're living. They're still able to maneuver. They're working. They're, they're engaging. They're not just uh, a body that's there. So these are healthier uh, individuals that are following, following, 
that are following this, this tactic. So eliminate processed foods, reduce, reduce or eliminate your consumption of animal-based foods, and lastly, increase your consumption of whole foods. Simple as that. You increase more whole foods, you're getting more of the essentials that your body needs, not just for your blood pressure, but for your body as a whole. And that's what's the biggest point that I want you guys to take away. This is not just a blood pressure lecture. This is for your overall health. This is for, for your body as a whole, because what happens is a lot of times we try to isolate certain problems that we're dealing with and try to treat the issue. And that's what the Western medicine is all about. Oh, you got high blood pressure? Let me give you a pill to treat this problem right there. And we're gonna, we're gonna keep giving you this pill. As long as you're taking your medication, you're gonna be okay. That's Western medicine in a nutshell. But we have to understand, as soon as you start to isolate a problem and just treat the problem and its symptoms, you ignore the body as a whole, and eventually that problem is going to manifest and create another problem because you're not getting to the root cause of it. So understanding that when you focus on your body as a whole, improve your overall health, this allows for you to correct these issues that you're dealing with, the blood pressure issues, the blood sugar issues, all these things. They're all tied together to the way you're living. They're directly related to your nutritional habits, your stress levels, your sleeping habits, your relationships, how much moving you're doing, and how often you're eating and consuming things. So understand there's six main categories that, that all tie into your health. And the better you understand where you're at on, this, on, those, on those spectrums with those categories, this is where you see where you need to improve with. Most people know if they're not eating, eating healthy. Most people know if they're not exercising enough. Most people know if, have, if they have sleeping problems. We know these things about ourselves. But now it's about understanding what you can do to get better. And that's what these challenges are all about. So <clears throat> I can rumble on sometimes, but <laughs> we're going to keep going. So now we got we linked the red meats and the processed meats to higher blood pressure. We talked about the eliminating process. And now we're going to go to the conclusion of actually, I'm showing y'all like y'all can see. We're going to the conclusion of putting it all together. So unlocking the secrets of better blood pressure, embracing the journey of discovery. On your quest to unravel the mysteries behind the blood pressure issues, there's one powerful step you can take, eliminating certain foods from your diet indefinitely. This bold move will provide valuable insights into the triggers that may be affecting your blood pressure. By removing these potential culprits, you'll also eliminate factors linked to endothelial dysfunction, which can contribute to blood pressure problems. It's a sacrifice worth making as it will give you a clearer understanding of how specific foods impact your blood pressure. Making these changes for yourself and committing, them, committing to them will be one of the best decisions you make for your overall health. While you may choose to reintroduce some of these items later, you'll do so armed with the knowledge of their effects on your blood pressure. And if I keep reading along, I'm pretty much going to be saying the same thing I've been, reading, been saying the whole time. So if you have any questions, feel free to drop them in the chat and we're going to round off the Pressure Purge Challenge. And before I start answering any questions, I want to make sure that we understand the strategies that we're implementing. And we're going to start back from part one and move into the pressure purge challenge parts two. And then we're going to go into part three briefly. That way we can understand how we're going to gradually progress on this journey. So part one, this was the fruit and salad challenge. Part one was the fruit and salad challenge. The goal of the fruit and salads challenge was to identify and understand the nutrients that your body needs to help you regulate your blood pressure. This is the potassium, the magnesium, the calcium, the sodium, the zinc, the antioxidants, all the other enzymes. We went through those, those nutrients to understand how they work when it comes to your overall health and your blood pressure, but most importantly, what foods you can consume to ensure that you're getting enough of these nutrients to help build up your nutritional storages. So that was our first week of the challenge, and the challenge insist and consisted of us consuming three to five servings of fresh fruits and vegetables, as well as one large salad per day. And that one large salad needed to be all fresh raw foods with no store-bought salad dressings because the store-bought salad dressing contains salt, oils, sugars, and other additives that can contribute to your health issues. So that whole first week, three to five servings of fresh fruits, one large salad with fresh raw vegetables on top and, all, and the homemade dressing that I provided you guys with the recipes, that was your stepping stone, simply adding those health-promoting foods to the diet. Step two, part two, the pressure purge challenge, 
is now pulling out those problematic foods, the salts, the oils, the sugars, the caffeine, the alcohol, the saturated fats, the excessive consumption of animal-based foods. We're pulling those things out to open up the pathways of elimination. Because when you open up those pathways of elimination, closing down the body from receiving those toxic foods, now your cells can do the job that they need to do without having to worry about the stress or the burden that they're under to try and cleanse it. Now you stop it from coming in, they could get rid of what's already there. And now once they get rid of what's already there and you're giving them the health promoting foods, they can build up the resilience to do the job that they need to do more efficiently. And this is where the rejuvenation effects start to occur. And this doesn't take months and years to happen. Many individuals can see results in three days, a week, and just continue to compound and get better because although you may see that improvement in your blood pressure, you have to build those cells up, build the body up. I think it's about roughly 90 days for your cells to turn over to recreate themselves. But when you get through this process and continue to build them up, you're on the path to allow for this cellular rejuvenation to actually occur. So three to five servings of fresh fruits and one large salad. And the next was the part two was re the removing process of all those problematic foods. And now this moves us into part three. Part three is the healing fast challenge. So not only are we going to be um, stacking up our strategies, the part one strategy and part two. Now we're going to be moving into part three, which is understanding how to apply fasting for healing. So now you have these other pathways closed off as well as you're giving your body those health promoting foods. Now we're going to apply different fasting strategies. That way you can accelerate these results. Now when you're fasting and you're allowing for your body to cleanse and heal itself, this allows for that cleansing cycle to continue to build and get stronger and faster and better and the rejuvenation starts to flow a lot more a lot easier so we're going to understand the different fasting strategies that we can apply to help us continue to get to the root cause of the problem and it doesn't matter what your current level of health is it doesn't matter what your job looks like it doesn't matter what you have going on outside of you because in this challenge there is a fasting strategy for each and every one of us to participate in. Doesn't matter if you're taking medication. Doesn't matter if you're uh, if you have the busiest schedule in America. It doesn't matter because there's a fasting strategy for each and every one of us that can allow us to continue to get better. And when you uh, when you address the health issues that you're dealing with through fasting, this not only just impacts your blood pressure, but you're talking about your cholesterol levels, your blood sugar levels, uh, your weight levels, all these metabolic issues that you may be dealing with, fasting touches on each and every one of them. And when you compound that with the other strategies that we're, that we're, that we're implementing already, you just continue to progress and get better. The name of the game for correcting blood pressure issues is gradual progression. There's no way around it. Ain't no trick. Ain't no pill. Ain't no juice I could give you. It ain't nothing I could sell you to help you correct your blood pressure issues. If I sell you a pill or a, a herbal supplement for your blood pressure issue, you're going to have to keep coming back to me in order to manage your blood pressure. And eventually, your body's going to get used to the, the stimulation that you're giving it, and the pills I'm selling you are never going to work again. So understanding that the most sustainable way to correct and improve the most sustainable way to improve your blood pressure and correct these issues to get off of pharmaceutical medications is by changing the habits that are causing the problem. Stress levels, your sleeping habits, your nutritional habits, your relationships, your lack of movement. Those are the, some of the key figures. And these challenges are going through to help you understand the tactics and strategies that you can apply. So the Healing Fast Challenge opened up yesterday. After we conclude this, se this session here, I'm going to send out the emails for the challenge. That way you guys can um, sign up and register, get the ebook that you need, just like we sent out the fruit and salad ebook, the pressure purge ebook. You're going to get the healing fast ebook and you can continue to move forward on the journey. And as you continue to gradually progress, you'll see the improvements in your health. And this is going to allow for you to reach that end goal. Remember, this is a six part series. And if you're serious about getting off of these blood pressure medications, see the process through. You got six weeks, six weeks. Build, get better, understand, keep moving forward. And this, I guarantee you, you're going to improve your health and ultimately reduce your reliance on prescription pills or eliminate them 
all together completely. So with that being said, I'm going to go ahead and go through these questions that you guys might have. And then uh, we'll just close out for the night because we got about three minutes left. It's about um, 8.30. I never like to keep y'all more than an hour. I know y'all want y'all got better things to do than sit here and hear me talk. So uh, fully appreciate you, Kellen Garden, and the thousands of group members in the group who are mostly supportive of my journey. It, it's definitely my pleasure to show up and um, provide insights and information. Uh, the main thing I, I want you guys to take away from it is that you have the power. Like, the power is not in the pill. The power is not in... Uh, <laughs> it's not... It's not outside of you. The power is within you. The power is, in with, the power is within each and every one of us. And it starts with making a choice, making a decision to do better. When you decide that enough is enough and you're sick and tired of being sick and tired, this is when change happens. So the power is within us. And taking the time to learn and understand what you can do and implement these tactics and strategies, this is how you're going to get to the end goal. And many individuals... They go through the first challenge and like, man, that was pretty simple, pretty easy. And I feel good. I lost the weight. My blood pressure came down. Let me start with the next one. And then just continue to steamroll and keep going. That's going to be um, some of the best things to do. My doctor told me that I couldn't get off of medication because of my blood pressure and genetics. I'm trying to prove her wrong. Do they truly believe this? Doctors truly think that genetics is the number one factor when it comes down to blood pressure. Not all of them. The ones that are not educated or, let's say, that don't really do a, enough continued education typically stand firm behind that. Reason being, it's easy. They don't really have to tell you. No, they could just, oh, man, you're never getting off these pills because of your genetics. Most people believe it, and they never question the, 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 the logic again. But you have to understand, continued education and continue, like science continues to show us that the power is within our actions when it comes down to our health. The way you live your life ultimately determines um, the quality of it and your health levels. If you live a crappy life where you're stressed out, you're eating bad foods, you're not exercising, what do you think at the end of the road? Like a glorious death? No, you're going to develop the cancers, the high blood pressure, the heart attacks, the strokes, and all those things behind it. But if you live in a health promoting life where you're sleeping good, you're managing your stress, you're eating healthy, you're exercising, Nine times out of ten, the end of your journey is going to look a whole lot better than the other side because your weight's going to be in check. You ain't have to worry about the cholesterol issues. Your cardiovascular system is nice and and strong and healthy, and you're going to be in those. You're going to be living in a health promoting path. And now, only thing in your way is natural causes or an accident. Because when you think about the top five causes of death, um, I'm not sure if I'm in the right order, but you got um, you have. Cardiovascular disease, disease, diabetes, cancer, medical malpractice, and um, I forgot the last one. Uh, medical malpractice, and there's one more. But uh, the, the top five causes of death, four of them are all controlled by your lifestyle. The medical malpractice one is technically controlled by your lifestyle as well. If you can stay out of the way of the hospitals, you could probably avoid the medical malpractice one. So understanding the top five causes of death are all centered around lifestyle choices. And if you eliminate the top five causes of death and you only have to worry about getting in an accident and things like that, your chances of having a health-promoting life is, a healthy life is, is pretty, pretty high. So just understand that when it comes down to genetics, genetics is like, doc, doctor, Dr. Clapper said this quote uh, regarding, he said this in one of his, um, he said this in one of his speeches that he gave. I think it was a TED talk, but I might be wrong. But with Dr. Clapper, he's a, he's a pretty famous or well-renowned uh, plant-based doctor. And Dr. Clapper said, your genetics is the bullet inside of a gun and i'm just paraphrasing your genetics are the bullet inside of a gun but your actions and your lifestyle is what actually pulls the trigger to fire that bullet that causes the chronic issues that you deal with so if you have a family history of chronic diseases cancer high blood pressure uh diabetes your fat is in your family history you have the genetics for this issue that bullet is loaded inside of your gun but if you're not living in the same manner as your mom, your dad, your, your grandparents, if you're not living the same lifestyle, you're not eating the same things or doing the things that they did, you're not going to fire that bullet to trigger these chronic health issues. 
So understanding that that is a small piece of the puzzle. Genetics is like five to 10 percent of the puzzle, especially with high blood pressure. And when you avoid and the way you avoid that genetic trigger is by living in a health promoting way, getting exercise, controlling your risk factors, uh, living, uh, living and ex exercising, uh, sleeping, um, managing your stress, doing all the things that are essential for your overall health. That bullet never gets fired, nothing gets triggered, and you live in a way where you don't have to deal with these chronic diseases. So continue to understand your lifestyle, continue to understand your habits and what you're doing, and this is going to allow for you to get to the end goal, which is to correct these blood pressure issues. The majority of these issues that we're dealing with are fired, are, are, are self-inflicted. A lot of us are dealing with blood pressure problems that all come from our habits. We, we're, we're shooting ourselves in the foot day by day by the things we eat, the things we do. So understand that you have the, the control and this is how you get to it. <clears throat> my energy levels have always been good, but lately I've, I've seen my energy levels have gotten even better. And that's a testament to your body having the nutrients that it needs to continue to build itself. So no, notice throughout this journey, you're going to see the improvements. You're going to feel the improvements. And this is why I talk about body language. Listen to your body. Because you got to listen to me. You do the right things and listen to your body. Your body's going to say, good job. You gave me what I need. I'm going to give you what you need. You gave me the food that I need to, to reset and heal. I'm going to give you a good night's sleep. You gave me a good, I gave you a good night's sleep. Now I'm going to give you all the energy you need tomorrow to run around and do X, Y, Z. It's a domino effect. It's a reciprocating effect. You give your body what it needs, it's going to produce what you want it to do. You're going to see your body continue to get better. It's the gradual progression and the building that resilience that you need. So definitely um, uh, congratulations to moving forward on the journey. Uh, Ms. Linda Brooks, can you send a link to get the book, please? Uh, the link should be inside of my bio. If you click on my YouTube picture, you would see my bio or the website there. And I also put it inside of the chat um, once the video is over. That way you can just click on it and go right to it as well. That way you can see all the other challenges that we have come, coming up. Uh, here we go. And I definitely appreciate you guys from, um, for showing up to be part of this uh, Pressure Purge Challenge. So again, the link is going to go out tonight for part three, the Healing Fast Challenge. Remember, sign up, get yourself together, prepare yourself for the challenge. That way, when we do kick things off, got your mindset together and you're continuing to move in the right direction. A lot of times individuals, you know, we fall off the wagon or we, we're not, we don't keep that flow going and it can cost us. But one thing I want to tell you guys is if you keep moving in the right direction and keep compounding, the faster you're going to get to where you need to be. So understanding this is a journey. You don't fix blood pressure issues overnight. This is a journey. This is a process. And we're going through six weeks of this to help you guys get that better understanding to get to the root cause of the problem. So with that being said, it's 835. We closed out the pressure purge challenge. I won't see you guys again to the next challenge, but you will see me on my pages where I do live videos and all my reels and uh, the short form videos and things like that. But I won't see you guys to the next challenge. The emails will go out shortly. And I look forward to seeing you guys with part three with the Healing Fast Challenge. So peace and blessings, everyone. Until next time.